Hi and welcome to another edition of the Blessing, Curse or Coincidence study series. In today's program we're going to be looking at a covenant that's often forgotten, not referred to, not really taught in the church, uh, the Davidic covenant and what it, what it represents, what it means, does it, does it have any place in today's society, has it been fulfilled and I'm joined uh, today in the studio by the uh, producer and director of Blessing, Curse or Coincidence, Mr. Hugh Kitson. Thank you very much for joining us in the studio. Alongside him is Murray Dixon, who is a, a Bible teacher from the uttermost parts of the earth, New Zealand originally, and it's a pleasure to have you in the studio. We're going to look at chapter four of the Davidic Covenant, which uh, is in volume one of Israel, the womb of the kingdom of God on earth. And uh, we're gonna see what it says about the Davidic Covenant. Let's join Lance as he takes us on that journey. A thousand years before Christ, the kingdom of Israel had been established in the land promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. David, who had slain the Philistine Goliath, was on the throne as Israel's king, For seven years, David reigned from Hebron before moving the seat of his throne to Jerusalem on the southern slope of Mount Moriah. Later in his life, King David purchased some land on the summit of what would become known as the Mountain of the Lord. When David moved his capital from Hebron to Jerusalem, he bought the threshing floor on the top of the Mount Moriah for 50 pieces of silver. It's very interesting, what, what was going on there was that God somehow had prompted David to, to find this, this piece of land which had already some history in Jewish salvation history in the sense of that's where Abraham had taken um, Isaac and was prepared to sacrifice him and where God had provided a substitute, the ram. But it, by now, it's become a threshing floor. The concept of the threshing floor, the winnowing, and the, and the selection of the wheat from the chaff, the grain from the, from the weeds, is all to do with the kingdom of God. And somehow in the spirit, I believe, David knew that a threshing floor was to be the foundational place When I look at the example of David, I see a man first and foremost who was a worshipper. He was a great man, he was a great military leader, he was a great musician, he was a, a great thinker, he was, he was great in many, many ways, but what made him great above all of that was, that a fact, was the fact that he had a heart after God. The scriptures tell us that the desire of David's heart was to build the house of the Lord, the temple, in that location on Mount Moriah. But because he had blood on his hands, the Lord told King David that this task would fall to his son and heir, Solomon. However, David was allowed to draw up the plans and make provisions for the costliest and most magnificent building the world had ever seen up to that time. When the temple was commissioned by King Solomon, the Shekinah glory of God came and filled it. The glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. The reign of King David, followed by King Solomon, was the historical zenith or golden age of the kingdom of Israel. Although David was refused permission to carry out his desire to build the house of the Lord, he was given an extraordinary promise by God. God promised King David, a man after his own heart, that his throne, the throne of David, would be an everlasting dynasty. This pronouncement by the Lord to King David has become known as the Davidic Covenant. 
Many years later, at a time of affliction, the psalmist would recall the Lord's covenant with King David. My covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It is interesting to note that down through the following centuries, the priests and rabbis believed that the Messiah would come from the line of David. Indeed, there are many who believe it to this day. What is more interesting is that the New Testament explicitly records the lineage of Jesus of Nazareth as going back to King David and also to our father Abraham. Without doubt, the promised Messiah is central to the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. The promise that through him and his seed all the families of the earth would be blessed, as we shall see later more fully. Today, the historical existence of the Kingdom of Israel, and particularly the existence of King David and King Solomon, and especially the existence of the Temple, is being challenged. In the last 150 years, scores of archaeologists armed with a Bible in one hand and a trowel in the other, have unearthed countless treasures. Dr. Shaul Sapir is a historical geographer from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Look at this, uh, in, in all the ancient towns, the tales that we have. A tale is a mount of many cities, as Dame Canyon explained. And uh, we have over there uh, evidence of uh, uh, palaces and of walls. Obviously, I would say that the debate between scholars are more relating to uh, the period of time, okay, the lower chronology or the higher chronology. But again, it doesn't make that much difference uh, if you're talking, the evidence is there. I mean, the people of Judah is uh, where they are, the people of Israel uh, are where they are. Since the old city of Jerusalem came back under Jewish sovereignty in the Six-Day War of 1967, Leading archaeologists, including Dr. Eilat Mazar, have unearthed much of the city that David and Solomon built. Dr. Sapir continues. Archaeological uh, excavations, the, I would say, what was found by uh, Dr. Mazar, it really shows what is uh, in the text, the biblical text, because uh, uh, it's mentioned over there how David built his uh, palace and uh, how King Solomon built his wall. So if you really follow the biblical text, you can see that we are talking about an enormous structure, or enormous structure, which uh, Dr. Mazar pointed out in a, a report that she did on the excavations in the city of uh, David, and also in the slopes, what we call today, the Ophel, in these two places, which really matches the, uh, the size, the enormous wall that was built by King Solomon, you see the evidence talking about the existence of the people of Israel at that time and of Judah. So no one, I mean, you can decide and you can say, all right, there, there was no Israelites and not Judah. You can say it, but the, what we prove in the, in the land and what we prove in the books and what we prove, prove in, uh, in uh, different texts, uh, doesn't matter if it's external or internal, okay, it shows that they existed. Welcome back to the studio. It's exciting to see what the Davidic Covenant is all about. And here in the studio, we're going to just unpack it a little bit further. Murray, what is the Davidic Covenant? Uh, has it been fulfilled? First of all, I'd like to say that of the covenants, the four covenants we're covering in the series, that each is an individual covenant 
but they're all related right back. They've got their roots in the Abrahamic covenant. And I think that's very, very important we realize that with the Davidic one as with each other one. And I'd like to refer to the key points of the Davidic covenant, which we find in 2 Samuel 7. The scenario, the context is God has spoken to Nathan the prophet and he's speaking uh, to David the king. And he said, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. I will establish his kingdom who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. When he does wrong, I will punish him, but my love will never be taken away from him. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, I know that we first of all must see that as speaking of David's son Solomon, okay. who had to be disciplined. Yeah. But it has another dimension. It has a, an eternal dimension because the throne, the kingdom, the king are all going to be forever. So in this, we seem to have uh, uh, two dimensions, the time factor, the eternal factor, I think are very, very important. So that when we look at Galatians, Paul's writing to the Galatians, he talks about the seed that comes from Abram. I believe that links directly into the Davidic covenant. And it's really referring to, in my understanding, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may ask me, well, how can you say that? Well, simply because Matthew begins his gospel, chapter one, with a genealogy that starts with Abram through David okay. to Jesus. Yeah. And I think this is the Levit Levitical Jew writing for Jewish people the biography of the Messiah. And this is the very Jewish way of, you know, writing out clearly this is the biography of the Messiah. It's amazing that the new covenant would start in such a way, a genealogy yes. looking back right to Abraham and David and, mm. and really, if you like, it summarizes what we've been talking about yes. over the previous program. So Hugh, tell me, where else in scripture do we find the Davidic covenant? Um, we find it also in 1 Chronicles chapter 17 and it's a very similar passage to the one in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7. But um, there's also another uh, very important scripture which we saw in the Davidic Covenant chapter. The Lord says, My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make endure forever, and his throne as the days of the sun. This somehow is really reinforcing what God said to, uh, to King David. Why then has God promised this throne of David to be an everlasting uh, thing? Why is it not a, a temporal thing? Um, I see it as going way back to the, uh, the line of Abraham, his descendants, when formerly they saw God as their king. And it went relatively well until they wanted to be like the other nations and wanted a king. And so they received Saul and that didn't work out. And then David. Now, my perception of this is that what God was doing at this point in raising up David, a man of his own heart, was to raise up a man who would be the type of the messianic king that would come from him. And that's why this has that everlasting dimension to it, that there's going to come from the line of David a king who will be the God king over the nation. And it seems to me that that's really what uh, Matthew's doing again in chapter 1, linking the two together here and saying that uh, this Messiah is going to be the God king okay. of this nation. That's interesting. Uh, you mentioned nation. I mean, what, what we're talking about all took place in a, in a relatively small area. I mean, uh, there is a city that is named after this David, uh, not only a throne of David, but also a city that is identified five with him. And, and within that geographical region is a place called Mount Moriah. Yes. Now, can you tell us a little bit of what happened, Murray, at Mount Moriah and, and why is it significant? Mount Moriah is an interesting place, isn't it? Uh, it always associates us with uh, Abram taking his son Isaac up there. 
Uh, I, by the way, I don't believe Isaac was a, a young man. I believe he was probably a lot older than we give credit for, but nevertheless. Um, and it's all about, isn't it, Isaac going up there with his father Abraham. And I, I suspect there wasn't a word spoken, but I suspect he had a fair idea of what was going to happen or planned to happen. And uh, there must have been tremendous tension and heaviness in both their hearts as they went up there. And uh, the, the fire was formed and ready, and then the ram was provided in the thicket. An incredible story, uh, a type, was it not, of the Son of God who would come as the Lamb of God or the Ram of God, as some people would prefer to say. And therefore, Mount Moriah speaks of sacrifice, doesn't it? It speaks of sacrifice of a son, of a firstborn son. It speaks of sacrifice to give others life. And so the Lord Jesus goes up to Mount Moriah, which becomes one of the three mountains that form the tabletop we know as the Temple Mount today that the Temple stood on. So I see there's a great relationship here. And in both occasions, Itzhak was submitted to his father, Abraham. Abraham, and Yeshua was submitted to his father, father God. Almighty God. Oh, fascinating. Yes. And there's, there's other things that took place in that, in that area that are being evidenced by archaeological discovery today. Yes. Now, within the clip that we saw, Hugh, uh, you as the producer, we interviewed a, a man by the name of Dr. Shaul Sapir. What, why choose to interview someone about the archaeology of the City of David? What's, mm. what's the significance to what we're talking about today? Well, it's actually being seriously challenged. I mean, even the existence of King David, King Solomon, and much more the temple uh, is actually being uh, seriously challenged as being historically authentic. Okay. And um, uh, among Israel's enemies today, um, it's often heard that the Jewish people, the Israelis, are trying to Judaize Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Mm. And uh, we felt it was very necessary to demonstrate from archaeology that what we have in the Bible is in fact historically accurate and true. And it, it, it's, it's actually vitally important in this day that we link uh, the presence of the Jewish people 3,000 years ago mm. back to the land. Uh, Jerusalem has been uh, the capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 years and indeed is the, the, the seat of the throne of David, so that's why we, why we um, interviewed him. And we, when we saw that evidenced in the archaeology that we saw, even in the short clip that we saw before uh, earlier on. Now, th within that, of course, there was a lot of activity that happened around Mount Moriah, and the, the priests and rabbis were, were very much involved in that region. Now, they understood from what we can see in Scripture that the Messiah would come from the line of David. Ha ha how did they figure that out? What is it that, that, that brought them to that conclusion? Well, it seems to me that uh, as we look through the prophets, uh, we look through the Psalms, we find this reference periodically about the Messianic King, David's name attached to it, everlasting attached to it, that this seems to occur throughout. One thing that I think is worthy of note today, as it was in the days of Jesus and Peter, was that the Jewish people never saw the Messiah as necessarily being God. Okay. The Messiah could be the king, the, the anointed one, but not necessarily God. And this, I think, is a, a high point in Peter's revelation at Caesarea Philippi at the foot of Mount Hermon when he said, you are the son of the living God. That was revolutionary. And today, this is still a problem amongst Jewish people. Even Jews who believe in Jesus, some of them still have a problem of being God, the okay. divinity. Okay, okay. Mm. So w within uh, the context of that, really, what we're beginning to delve into is the, the whole question of this covenant that could almost be termed the forgotten covenant by many of the Western churches and indeed a, a lot of the Jewish people were, had no, no concept of, of this throne of David and what's attached to it. Uh, you, you mentioned to me before, Hugh, the, the fact that it's the forgotten covenant. Why, why do you term it in such a way and, and what's the significance of it? Well, let's first of all say that 
it's not forgotten by God. Absolutely. It, it, is, it is forgotten by the church. And I, I, I read earlier from Psalm 89, yes, you did. And, and God uh, makes it very clear that he hasn't forgotten it. But there are many other scriptures that also refer to um, the Davidic covenant. And one of them is actually very well known by Christians. In fact, for those of, uh, of you who are Anglicans, <laughs> as you are, Murray, um, this, this is a passage that's read every year in the Festival of uh, Nine Lessons and Carols, and it's in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of his increase, sorry, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, it's very interesting. Um, the kingship of the throne of, of David is not necessarily linked to the Godhead, mm. but this passage actually does that, and mm. Christians know this passage uh, very well. Now, have we seen it fulfilled? This is, a, this is a very interesting question. Have we actually seen this particular passage, this promise of God, fulfilled today? Yes, we recognize the Son, um, we recognize that the child has been born, um, but has the rest of it yet been fulfilled? Has it? Well, mm. and it's very interesting. Another question I've got, too, yeah. is we've got the genealogies. You mentioned the one in Matthew, Murray. Mm -hmm. yes. We've also got one another Luke. one in Luke. Yes. Why are these genealogies there in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. Good question. Why is it so important that Jesus is established as the heir to the throne of, um, of David. Why is it established? Um, I'm sure you're um, going to tell is us. A, this <laughs> is a no, this is a question for the... Uh, I, I'm asking Christians now, yeah. why is that there? Yes. And then we have another amazing passage in Luke chapter 1. Again, yes. this is a very well-known story because I mean, there are a lot of Christians, uh, Christian leaders today who say to us, well, you know, the Old Testament's been replaced by the New mm -hmm. Testament. These promises that we've just read, the Davidic covenant, well, you know, it's a bit of poetry, a bit of license, and, you know, what really is the importance of it? But you come to the New Testament, and again, the Davidic covenant is talked about. And again, this it comes up at Christmas time every single year. Yes. Um, the angel Gabriel... Yep came to visit uh, Mary, or her Hebrew name is actually Miriam. Yeah. And um, uh, we find here in um, verse 30 of Luke chapter 1 that the angel Gabriel says to Mary, Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. Now, Yeshua is actually his Hebrew name, and the word Yeshua in Hebrew means salvation. So that's a pointer yes. to his destiny, because um, yeah. Hebrew names, or, or in, in the Jewish world, the name is very important. Then the angel Gabriel goes on and says to, to her, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, mm. and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Of course, that, that links right back to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Why are these things here in the New Testament? Yeah. Um, I, I'd like our audience just to think about that. Why are those there? There seems to me to be a whole area of the destiny of our Lord Jesus Christ that has yet 
to be fulfilled. And you, and you tie it in there, interestingly, it also mentions ja Jacob. Exactly. Which is, is the, the Abrahamic covenant that we yeah. haven't highlighted was not only promised to Abraham, it was also reiterated to Isaac and to Jacob, and it, it consisted of land, of mm -hmm. seed, and a blessing. And, and what we focused on really in this program is the seed mm -hmm. element, yeah. the mm -hmm. seed of uh, coming out of Abraham through the whole of the Old Testament, ultimately leading to the Messiah, had to come through David. Yes. Mm. And uh, that's astonishing. It really is that God would be so specific with regard to seed mm. and, and the outworking of it. The, uh, the other thing that you, you draw, draw on in uh, Isaiah 9, um, which is, I, I think is tremendous, it says, For a child, unto us a, a child is born, but a son is given. So he was a son before he was a child. Yes. Mm. And that alludes back to the mm. fact that he was there right at the very beginning. Mm. And so this is tied in, the Davidic covenant that we've talked about in this program is, t is tied in with the Abrahamic covenant and indeed with the new covenant as well as the outworking of all of history. Mm. And a throne is directly associated with government, directly associated with the ruling and reigning that is to uh, come in the days ahead. It's been a wonderful pleasure having the producer uh, Hugh on the show and, uh, and Murray again. We uh, will be looking in the next program at Rebellion and Exile. We'll be joined by Murray in the studio and David Noakes will also be with us to look at uh, what happened when the Jewish people were exiled from the land, the reason they were exiled and uh, what brought them back. And also, just as a reminder, if you want more information with regard to this series, please Google us. Blessing Curse Coincidence, the whole film and all the information to do with it will come onto your Google. So God bless you and join us next time.